Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sai, and I'll be moderating today's session. Here we are with another session for you. Let us make it interactive and use this opportunity to its fullest. Hi, sir. It's a pleasure connecting with you virtually. Before we start with the session, I would like to give a small introduction about our speaker. Joan Pacanyol is the in-house brand strategy expert at Mutro. He has several international management degrees under his belt. His experience spans across a wealth of businesses and industries, both on the client side and as a consultant on the agency side. He has more than 10 years of experience as a brand strategy consultant, working for clients like Doc Morris, BBVA, La Caixa, Renfe, Isare, Catalana Occidente, Primavera Sound, Levi's, Telefonica, FC Barcelona, RMKAN, The Ocean Race, and Telemadrid. Also, Joan has served for 10 years as an executive manager in several cultural and public institutions around the world. He eagerly participates in knowledge sharing and exchange activities. Today, Joan co-leads the strategy and business section of Post Graphica Master Degree at IDEF and lectures on brand management at Elisava, public communication branding at the University Pompeii Fabra and experience-driven branding at the Food and Beverage Sustainable Entrepreneurship Master of the UAOCEU. We are glad to have you, sir. I would like to request the audience to keep their cameras on to make this session more interactive. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, Sai. Thanks a lot for, for, for your detailed introduction. It, feel, it makes me feel a little bit old after, after such a long introduction. Thanks, thanks for having me. I'm super, super happy to, to be here. And as you said, I would, I would thank if, if our friends, if our colleagues, if our pals can turn the cameras on. And please, uh, we have just one hour, but if at some point somebody wants to make a question or something, I'm open to that, if that's something that we can manage easily. Uh, I have a lot of content and I'm happy to share, but we can skip some parts and or we can deepen, no? we can go deeper in other parts if that's more interesting to you guys, okay? Let's go for it. Can everybody hear me well? Is the sound, the video, everything okay? Yes. Fantastic. Let's go for it. Hello, Avantika. Thanks. It's lovely to connect with you. I'm a fan of your country. I've been there a couple of times, and I was more than excited when 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 you guys connected connected mucho and myself. So thanks for having me. I'm always happy to have uh, interactions with people. And I just love people. And I believe our business design and communications is about talking to people and learning from people. So thanks for having me. It's a great opportunity. I'll, since we don't know yet, uh, and I believe there is an interesting, maybe an interesting insight here that connects with branding and what we do at Mucho. I'll first introduce myself uh, because as Said said, now I'm working with these super cool designers, you know? These guys are the owners of Mucho. They are super cool. They are super creative. They are fantastic people. But me, at the beginning of my career, I was only a business school boy, a sad, uh, not so creative business school boy. But I believe, but I did something crazy when, when after I graduated because after studying in different business schools all over the world, boom, suddenly I jumped, I went crazy and, 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 go, and went into the arts, first into the cinema, then into another creative industry, Suma Design House. This is one of the first independent branding agencies in Spain. I recommend you to take a look at it if you are interested, uh, because this is, the, this is a place where many, many strategists learn the profession in, in, in Spain. But then I, I kept on going in, in, into the arts management. This is a cultural center in the north of Spain designed by the legendary Brazilian architect, Oscar Niemeyer. And there I learned from all types of arts. But I also went to the classical arts and worked in Madrid for the classical theater, but then went to the other side of the arts, of performing arts. And in Matadero Cultural Center, we organized the Fringe Madrid, the craziest, performing arts festival in Spain for some festival of performing arts. Well, I was learning and I was going from business for a, from business to arts for one reason.
because being designers to be in that position when you go outside in the real world the strange tips but you you have a business with my friends from the university we all have a business background and they keep working in very busy let's say cold business areas but i'm relating to them more or a strange guy in that in that room too as i say this has superpowers and i'm not the first person to say that that is something very it is something very clear that coco chanel also said you know order to be irreplaceable one must be always different if you become the same thing and we can see that in design a lot what they call blending especially in the world of 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 new tech brands you are going to be replaceable because we don't want as brands as designers to fall in what we can call a sea of sameness and that's a huge challenge and a huge threat to designers and that's something that I keep on telling to my team, my team of brand strategists and the team of designers that work with me at Mucho. I appreciate a lot, you know, having something weird, having pe peculiar hobbies, having something, some can still say one of his notes. There has to be something weird about good designers. There has to to be something weird about good brand strategies. And all of them have a couple of things. They always have an off-center perspective. And that is what Pablo Juncadella, one of the founders of Mucho, that's how he de defines creativity. Creativity is looking at the same thing from a different angle. And that's what a good designer needs to have and a good planner needs to have too. And also this mix of, this eclectic mix of backgrounds. It's good to work in design with a business background. It's good to work in business with a design background. And actually, I want to ask you this thing, guys. If we were in a, in, a, in a smaller group, I would ask you all to say it out loud, but please think it for yourselves. What makes you different from your friends? You're all studying the same, you will have same backgrounds, you will go out into the professional world, and what will, will make you relevant is not what makes you equal, but what makes you different. So I would strongly invite you to and always, I never be shy about it. This is something that is very Catalan and now I'm not talking about myself too. I don't know if, if any of you has been to Spain and we have this like design and business. It's like the human towers that we build. This is something useless, something that makes no sense to build human towers, but it demands a lot of engineering, but it demands a lot of crazy co courage too. So this combination, I believe, shapes a lot the, the ethos of the Catalan people, but also the ethos of good, of good branding, okay? Again, this is another example of what I was meaning. The combination of the rational and the emotional, the combination of thoughts and, um, and feelings. This is, these are two views of Barcelona. On one side, you have Le Chample, my neighborhood, which is super square, designed very perfectly, that's super useful, it makes a lot of sense. But on the other side, you have Salvador Dalí, the craziest, the craziest and most creative type of, of, of artist. And you know, that combination is what makes Barcelona. And that combination, we can see it in brands too. Look at this guy, everybody knows he represents Microsoft, Bill Gates. On, on one side, he presents himself very seriously with the president of India, Mr. Modi. On the other side, he's playing as a DJ. Well, that's what brands are. Modern brands are very rational because they have to solve complexity and bring value to people, to investors, to shareholders and stakeholders. But at the, at the same time, Brands need to be emotional too, because they need to connect, because they are going to be our life partners. So as creators of brands, we will need to combine those two. And this is why I introduce myself like this, because on my transition, on my road going from business to arts, I cross many artists and designers going on the opposite direction. 
in that in that crossroad in that junction where business ideas meet creativity is where the best branding is made so i invite you to be super creative but at the same time make a lot of sense and be very argumentated when you approach things because you will always be as professionals a, a bridge between the rational and the emotional, the emotional and the rational. And I believe you can see that uh, during my presentation, I will be sharing some content from, from the masters that we do, the post graphica, as I uh, explained in the introduction, but also some projects, real projects from, from Mucho, okay? This is the first one I'm going to share. And I believe this one is, is good to, to, to exemplify, to explain this combination of what's of, of the rational and the emotional side of brands. This is a very new case, one of the biggest brands we have worked for. This is the leading e-commerce of pharmacy in Europe, and they are going through a huge, uh, a huge transformation because they want to do more than just deliver medicines. They want to be partners uh, of every citizen on a one-to-one -one relationship and take care of all your health. Okay, so they came from this very cold uh, logistics product uh, product centric brand, and now they want to be like you know a versatile brand that stands for something that is really really relevant in your life, and you want to trust it. Okay, so let's see this transition. This is a video. I hope please tell me if it doesn't play well, and I will stop it. This is a two or three minute that explains the case, the transition. And let's see if you like it. I believe it, it, it explains well, as I said, the combination, the needed combination of the emotional and the rational side when building a powerful modern brand. Let's go for it. The Zurus A Group is the leading European e-pharma corporate group. Amongst its portfolio are some of Europe's top online providers of OTC, BPC, and chronic illness medications. The aim of this rebranding process was to build Europe's first and most patient-centric health ecosystem brand. One clear identity that would convey a world of health in one click. After extensive market and user research, Doc Morris was chosen to be the group's leading brand, which implied its total transformation from online seller to a fully patient-centric health platform, from delivering pharmaceutical products to an integrated and personalized e-health ecosystem. This new era posed two great challenges. Firstly, the brand should no longer stand for pharma, but for health. Secondly, the German public knows Doc Morris very well as disruptor and a price challenger. The new Doc Morris has to engage with pharmacists and traditional health professionals as much as with technologists and visionaries, because in an ecosystem context, the old competitors are the new partners. The solution to both challenges was plain and simple, getting closer to patients and pharmacists by constructing a new brand narrative that emphasizes the emotional values Doc Morris stands for, as opposed to a purely transactional positioning. Together with our clients, we molded essential brand values like passion for health, patient empowerment, and 360-degree personal care into a synergized brand symbol, a heart that explains these concepts in a direct but poetic way. The new custom typeface conveys trust, but with a differential aspect of using a serif font for a digitally native brand. The dotted serif detail binds its personality with the brand symbol, a new set of colors, tools, and a new tagline, health for life. As a first step in a new era of storytelling for Doc Morris, last Christmas, a brand campaign was launched with no reference to products or services, but the values and emotions of its user. It was conceptualized to explain the values Doc Morris now stands for. The campaign was a massive success and brought the brand to the hearts and minds of all Europeans, exceeding every expectation with more than 147 million viewers globally. The process of integrating several brands into Doc Morris has already started, and some of the current national leading pharma brands in Europe are adopting this new branding as a common element. It's the beginning of a journey that will ultimately enable European citizens to manage their health needs and data their way, so they can concentrate on their lives 
while dog Morris cares for their health. In other words, health for life. Well, I hope you liked it, but did, did you see how even health, even health is both rational and emotional? How did we bring the leading German e-pharmacy brand into the European ecosystem? How did we transform this brand into a European ecosystem of health? Well, we did it with health, sorry, with feelings and emotions. Not, so, not only talking about the features of the new service, okay? Because at that level, we need to connect with people and even things like trust are built with emotional values too. Now I'm going to show you the campaign that the video was referring to. This, this campaign was not made by Mucho. It was made by a fantastic agency in Germany called Jungvomat. We work with them to brief them and to get to the concept and to explain the, the values of the, new, of, the new company, of the new brand. But I want you to see it to understand how, as I claim for, for the rational sometimes, sometimes it's the, the, the transformation can be expressed in emotional terms too. And see this video because this is a very strong story with almost no words that doesn't show any products or new features of, of, this, of this new brand. Even if the new brand is going to, to, to deliver better services and better products, but the campaign is just about the emotions. And talking about the emotions, we explain a revolution in terms of technology. But please see the campaign and, and I hope you liked it. It's been a major success and I insist. This is an emotional story to explain a product transformation or a in health. Well, sorry, you don't need to speak German to understand, don't you? Do you? It's just helpful life. I'm sorry, there's one little thing that appears on my screen now. I don't know. 
well, I'll keep going. All right, now I'll tell you about, I hope you like the video. Um, again, as I said, a good example of, of emotions uh, put to work to build a strong brand. Now I wanna tell you about Mucho because um, Mucho is the place where I've been working for the last five years and the place that where, where, where I've, I've seen what I've been describing happening in the best and in the most original way and authentic way. Which is the uh, we call it a, uh, the global boutique of design and but but all, uh, design studio. It is a studio owned by designers, and I love that as someone going from business to to the creative sector. But there, I found the group of professionals that really believe in what they in what they design. Look, Mucho was born in Barcelona. Uh, but it's dedicated to the world. We say we are not international or global. We are local everywhere, which was founded in 2022, sorry, in 2002, and now has uh, uh, another big office in San Francisco, a smaller one in Paris, a new one in Melbourne, in Australia since last year, and a tiny one in New York. But as I said, in every place, we, we are very rooted, so we work internationally from every city. Another thing that is interesting is the, the idea of the team. We work by teams. There is not a single assignment that is individual. And even within every agency, there are teams. These teams are form of peoples of different backgrounds. As I said, mostly graphic designers, as I guess most of you are, but also people from other backgrounds like myself, or, or Carol, or my pals, Anna, Steffi, Marta, etc., etc. One thing about, about, about the way we work, and I believe it is interesting because when agencies grow, sometimes they get the, the, the best creatives and the best minds or, or the founders get disconnected from projects. And this is something that never happens in Mucho. Uh, because one of the founders and creative directors of the firm will always be involved directly in any project. We've worked with clients of all type. We, we have never specialized ourselves. It is true that lately we are working more and more for digital brands, but brands of any, digital brands of any kind. Uh, more and more we work for brands in almost all countries, but we have never worked that I know for an Indian brand. So please, please, if you can spread the word, we would love to work in India. We would just love it. That's the country, the next, the next challenge for us, okay? Well, the, the, the design side, and since I am not a designer, I can say it with, with humbleness, but my, my, my pals, the, the founders of, of, of Mucho, some of them have, well, most of them have been awarded and they, we are in a very, very strong position in terms of influence, in terms of design. And you know, me as a strategist, that has always helped me. That has always helped me. Okay, what are the, what are the, the services that we give at, at Mucho? We give different services. The ones I take most care of are the brand strategy and brand narrative. Uh, this is, I will talk about this later on. This is what most knows as the brand storytelling. Another service, important service that connects a lot the consultancy with the design side is the what we call the brand architecture. That's organizing the brands in a way that they are relevant to the audiences, to the stakeholders, but also very easy to manage uh, for those who are going to manage it. Sorry for the pleonasm. Uh, brand identity is building, well, you know what brand identity is. Campaigns, we do very little, but we do some, or we work on the graphic design or in the brand narrative of them. More and more digital, less and less editorial, or less print editorial. Uh, because of COVID, less and less environmental too, and less events, just like everywhere in the world. Etc. 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 I mean, there is no news here for you guys. What I'm going to play now is the new reel of Mucho. I don't know. Maybe some of you. Have seen it, but these are two things that just have been done recently. So I'm going to play it. I hope you like it too. Thank 
Okay, this is what we've done, and we will deepen in a couple of cases during this session. But let's talk about the vision and about how we do things, because I believe that's what might be of more interest of you guys, for you guys. Well, as I believe I said in the beginning, the motto of the studio, and that's what I love the most when, when, I, when, when I join them, is design with meaning. Uh, the meaning thing is what me as a strategist I would call branding or strategy or brand strategy. So where does design start? Design is not just about creativity. Design starts in the mind, not in the hand. That's what we mean. So we start with the context. Actually, this is what we say in our communications. These are our statements. We partner with visionaries to create meaning and design. Sorry, I cannot see the full thing. To create meaning and design relevant brands. Sorry. We prepare brands for the future, enabling change and evolution. Think about this, guys. When you design something, you're not just expressing the present. You are choosing the future for that brand. Because what you are trying to do is to anticipate the future, not just to represent the past. If you represent the past when you design, you are doing an heraldic shield, not necessarily a brand, okay? So context is super important. This is the way we are addressing in our brand new website, what we do. We are all about meaningful brands. So think about it, we do design, but actually what we deliver is brands. And ultimately, what we deliver is meaning, meaning that our customers, our clients will be able to use with their users and with the rest of society. And what it takes to, and then it takes a visionary company on the other side. That's why we need to relate to the future, not so much to the past. And what design has to do in this whole equation, it is to represent, of course, but most of all, to inspire. And as you can see in our website, but also in, in, in every detail or aspect of Mucho, we combine what we call creative strategy with collective intelligence, with the power of images. We are craftsmen of the image and the global rich aspect. 
Many ideas and lots of images, lots of questions and many answers, much discussion, much thinking, several concepts and a lot of things said. Loads of feelings, loads of passion, loads of laughs, tons of coffee, a few early mornings, some late nights. Not just seeing, really looking, plenty of sketching, millions of clicks, photos and videos, countless alphabets, all the colors, and quite a few shapes. No bullshit, no fakes, no lies, some mistakes, a lot of honesty, a lot of courage, a lot of teamwork, a lot of truth. A small world, a handful of partners, friends that mean much, and a lot to share. Growing challenges, constant creation, some breakthroughs, and a lot of growth. Much believing, much imagination, much design, and a little bit more. This one is an old video but I believe it's very beautiful and I wanted to share it with you that somehow the insights of Mucho, but how do we do it? Okay, these are more or less the principles of the ways we do things and this could be sort of, I don't know, recommendations. See them as a recommendations from an old guy who's been working in the field for a while. Uh, but the things, the way we do things in, in Mucho is by by listening to people we listen a lot we make a lot of questions you saw that in the video a lot of questions and some answers but to understand markets to understand the world uh, it is crucial to ask a lot actually bear in mind that you are and we are experts in design or in branding or in brand strategy but we work with companies who are experts in their field and we keep on entering in different categories in different fields working for in different situations. So we cannot be experts of everything. It is impossible. That's why we need to work with what we would call collective intelligence. Collective intelligence is a bigger intelligence. It's the bigger, it's the bigger intelligence that is produced when your best intelligence and knowledge is combined with the best intelligence and knowledge of your clients. So the best of your branding knowledge and design knowledge combined with their best uh, knowledge about their field is what is going to produce something that makes a difference. If it is that only your side that imposes to the other side, maybe the solution will not be relevant enough. If what imposes is the client side, maybe the solution doesn't last long, doesn't touch uh, deep enough the hearts of people, doesn't work technically, etc., etc. So what do we want? Is the is the is the well, the road in the middle? That's why I keep on saying, and we keep on reminding in mucho that design follows a strategy, and strategy follows analysis. Look, if you don't take a look at the at the context, you cannot design well. If you can, if you not think and ask the stakeholders, you will not design relevantly. That's why first you analyze then you strategize and then you design. And the whole thing is the design, the, the true and full design process. Actually think, think, think about the doctor. What happens when you go to a doctor? A designer and a brand strategist, we are consultants, just like a doctor. You go to the doctor and he's going to analyze you. He's going to do a test, something. Then he will make a diagnosis and he, say, and he will say, oh, Saeed just broke her leg. That's why I need to do something with her leg. And then she's going to do the treatment for Saeed's leg. But he won't, the, the doctor won't do just the treatment without having a strong diagnosis. And he won't have a diagnosis until he has done some tests. In this case, maybe an X-ray to Saeed's leg. And that is exactly the process that you as designers, we as professionals in branding follow and have to follow in any situation. What, analyze, diagnose and make a decisions and then visualize them or or yes visualize them pretty much bear in mind something that my grandmother used to tell me we have two ears and only one mouth that's why we should always listen twice what we say okay 
and especially in our fields. Look, communication and design is more about listening than it is about saying. And it happens in, in a room and it happens in the biggest media situations, okay? We need to listen actively. Hmm? And communication is as much about listening as it is about saying. Okay, another way in which we do things, I, I, I made reference to this. Actually, my title is Chief of Creative Strategy. Uh, we call creative strategy to the process in which we do things, a process in which creativity and strategy go together hand in hand from the beginning to the end. Of course, we start with the analysis, but it is something in which the designers also participate. It's not something that we do alone. Of course, we do diagnosis, but diagnosis is something in which designers participate as well. And of course, we do design, but in design is something in which the strategists participate as well. That's how if we do the, the road, all the journey together, the two sides together with the client, we are going to do something relevant and creative. This is how our process looks like. Okay, when we get into a company or into a new project, we are in the situation number one. Uh, normally, there is a little bit of chaos. Okay, there is a little bit of chaos, even if it is a new company, there is a little bit of, of mixed visions, etc. etc. Number two is the analysis. Those are different methodologies. I'm sure you have yours, I'm sure your teachers are teaching you some of them. Uh, and you will develop different ones, your own, your own methodologies to do analysis. The typical ones are interviews, interviewing the clients, doing online questionnaires to stakeholders, doing market research, consumer intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, but also auditing the brand. What has happened to this brand until today? How, how are their channels? How does the social media look like, okay? But also the benchmark, huh? benchmark analyzing the competence, other references, best practices, et cetera, et cetera. And then we do a lot of workshops with the client. I was talking about collective intelligence. Well, we need to do workshop sessions, creative workshop, workshop sessions with the client in order to pull that collective strategy. And we also visualize what, 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 what we see, but I'm going to speak about that later. So imagine this situation, we go through this funnel, we do a lot of analysis so we can get into one central idea for the new brand. And at that point is where we can start producing outputs that are going to build the identity the, of the new brand. We can deliver a brand purpose, a brand manifesto, the personality of the new brand or the tone of voice, the architecture I was referring to. And with all those elements defined is where is how we can make names, design identities, design campaigns. We are building a culture. We can do employee branding, internal branding, we will be able to do content that is relevant and also creative and also guide the, the CX and the UX. We are not experts in the field, but we do bridge our design and the definition of, of, of the new brands together with our friends who do the, who are the experts in UX. Another way in which we do things and something that you guys have to bear in mind when you build a new brand, we were building a new story. We designed to create what we call visual brand narratives. So brands are stories and those stories travel more than ever in, in, in visual terms, okay? I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. If you don't, please take a look at it. It is, it is crucial. This is a fantastic machine to make brand stories, okay? That's the perfect trick, the perfect trick. We use it all the time. I'm not going to deepen into it, but I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a couple of comments. Because as Simon Sinek says, same thing in Mucho, the most powerful brands nowadays, uh, they start their narrative addressing one question. The question is why? Why does this brand exist? Why does this brand does do what he do, what they do? Why does this brand do what they do? Well, look, all great brands have one reason why, one strong value that's at the core of everything. 
of everything that they do and guides everything. What is the value of the next brand you're going to build? Look, Apple is creative in everything that they do. So creativity is in one way or in the other, clear in everything that they do and inspires everything. Nike is about inspirational performance, about honoring great athletes, but not only the professional ones, also the amateur ones, but those who feel great inside. Airbnb is clearly about belonging, about finding no strangers, about building a world where everybody can meet everybody and stay in everybody's bed. So not bed, necessarily, sorry for that, or house, paying, of course. And Tesla is doing no matter if it's roofs, roofs, solar roofs, cars, or other stuff, but all of them are in, the, in, in looking for sustainability. And same thing with Amazon. Amazon is all about convenience, no matter what they do. So those are why reasons, those are why values and they bring and they build very strong narratives. Then you have the hows and you have the what's. Those are the things that are going to make you different. But the why is where strong brand narratives start. And if you haven't, I totally invite you I, I kindly invite you to see Simon Sinek's video because that's going to help you a lot. Because at the end, customers don't buy what you do, but why you do it. We are no longer in the market of features, but in the market of values. And then there is another important thing. As I said, we are designers. We, work in, we are living in a visual world. So whatever the values of a brand is, in their construction, as early as, 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 as in its construction, we need to be able to translate them into images. I'm sure my image of innovation is different to Sayi's image of innovations and to Rat Data's uh, image of innovation and to each of you's different Im uh, image of innovation. That's why we, we have to do also visual workshops and understand the client also in visual terms and un understand the market also in visual terms. And here I want to show you just a little, a little video about uh, logo type design because this is one of the strengths of Mucho. And this is, I believe, and I tell you this as a non-designer, one of the most difficult things that uh, can be done in, in design. Look, the logo type is the Elevator pitch of the elevator pitch. I mean, is something that has to be have a strong, the strongest representative power, but at the same time has to be super differential so that if you see it in one second, you recognize it. I believe this is a work of craft, very difficult, and I'm happy to share this made by my colleagues at Mucho. Hopefully you will like it. This is a collection of 50 logotypes done by Mucho, which we call a visual ideas. When I was younger, I always thought that life was something simple. I never tried too hard to keep it natural. Between the boy and girl, it was so simple.
Okay, another visual aspect. Another visual aspect that is very important to have bear in mind and, and, and take into account since the beginning is the touch points. I mean, brands, since brands, I said everything's visual, everything is happening more and more on screens. So the response, the brands being re responsive is absolutely key. And you have to know what are the touch, the, the, the touch points of a brand be, before you're, you're even defining it. You need to really know the customer journey if there is one, et cetera, et cetera. So those things are in both sides, again, are inside of analysis and in the side of creativity. This is what a, I mean, not all brands are the same in all their sizes, and I'm sure you're familiar with responsiveness, but it is a crucial detail when making brands that make the difference nowadays. Okay, and in the end, what is happening? What, what, what are you going to do when you are in, out in the market working for real clients or what you are doing in your, in your, in your projects that I've seen in the website, amazing projects by, by, by uh, uh, amazing pro projects on my opinion. And what we do, what are we doing in, in our current life, in our profession? Look, in the end, we're always managing change. On the side, you have the annual report of the European Investment Fund before Mucho. On the right, you have the one that we did. You know, whenever the clients come, what they are asking us is to help them in transforming something. Either they want to rebrand, either they have a problem they want to solve. So in the end, very in the end, we are agents of change and change managers. And you have to bear that in mind and, all, and always take account of it and learn, as I said, from any experience. On one side, you have a supermarket worker. On the other side, you have the catalog of one of the most influential fashion designers in the world, designed by Loren, uh, the creative designer of, uh, sorry, the creative director of Mucho Paris. I mean, we learn from both sides and not being a specialized, I believe, is something good that has benefits. Now I'm going to show you one case because this is the, this one that I was talking about, the European Union, because I believe it's beautiful and is another case that explains how with creativity we could address things that were really, really, really complex and we could have not done with the, without the superpower of super design. Look, this is the European Investment Fund. It looks like one of the most boring places in the world, possibly it is. This is where they manage a lot, a lot, a lot of money of the European Union uh, to invest in small and medium enterprises, what is called SMEs all over Europe and to help them uh, in growing and transforming Europe. You know, this type of companies, just like in many places in India, there are startups, Actually, one of the companies that, that was invested by this, by, by this institution was Spotify. I'm sure all of you know it, or most of you know it. Well, these are the, the shareholders. I mean, they, they are politicians. So it is very difficult to work with this brand, you know, because whatever major decision takes the vote of 27 ministries of economy of the 27 members of the, U, the European Union. So what these guys wanted to do is to fully rebrand their organization because they were noticing that they were doing excellent work, which actually they do. They, were, they, were, they had a lot of resources, they had a lot of plans, but they were so boring, so cold, so opaque, so shady, that they were finding a hard time to connect with the entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs would go to ask for help to all the places before going to the EIF. And that was the problem. But the problem was too, that it could not be rebranded. We could not change the logotype. Changing the logotype takes the vote of 27 countries. So that was literally impossible to do, but they needed to make a revolution in the brand. So the first thing was understanding what was the EIF's position in, 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 in the journey. And we had to spend a couple of months working with a client to understand who was who and who was making what and what were we were communicating to whom. So we understood that there were different publics and that sometimes, and not all publics had the same needs at every point of the equation. And actually that we were just reporting and we were communicating very little. So we did this golden circle. We worked on a narrative, but more than that, we worked on a brand manifesto that I'm going to skip, but more than that, that allowed us to revolutionize 
the company without touching the logotype because there is more than a logotype to build an, uh, an ID and through excellent design, we brought the EIF to this more human, more surprising, more modern, more inspiring type of branding that they have brought to all corners of their organization now. And actually we also crafted, made together with them the tagline that the concept for this for this new brand something that seems like a contradiction and something that a lot of creatives didn't do call your bank because in your bank you can find the eif and we did this campaign all over europe with these super strong colors in all languages that inspire that hopefully is inspiring a new generation of european entrepreneurs i hope you like it I just adore these colors. Step one, have a dream. Your own recording studio, so you can get into producing, start a label, and win a few Grammys. I'm going to pass this video because it's a little bit too long, but well, see how this, even the events of this institution, this pan-European institution, were totally transformed in order to be more attractive and more engaging to their how the, their original audience, the state, the entrepreneurs, and not so much just to bosses and to ministers of economy. Look, this is an event for new entrepreneurs, and we called it that is called the ugly duck. You know, the ugly duck is going to become a swan. That's the analogy that we can do with the startups. This is an official European event that finally is cool and entertaining to everyone. But look, I believe we just have a few minutes left. I have too much material with me. And I was wondering what would be of more of your interest to see a couple of cases or to ask questions or to keep me going for five more minutes. What do you think? Saeed? We can, we can go, uh, go on for like five minutes and then we'll take questions. Okay. Then I'll, I'll try to do one part super fast because I believe it's interesting. Well, you know, we've, you, you must have heard it now, the economy of experience. And that's interesting. The most precious things in life are, are not material. I don't know if you all, if you know this, this work of art by Banksy that was self-destroyed as it was sold. And, and that was the beauty of it. Well, in economical terms, we call experience the last phase of, of the evolution of goods. Now, at the beginning, we had commodities like grape, then it, we had products, then we had services, the guy, so you got the wine delivered, then you at home, and then you have the, service, the, the, the experience economy. It's no longer about the grape or the wine or the delivery of the wine, but big brands are built through events like tasting events, wine events, or parties of events, lots of events, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we call the experience economy. And in that experience, the way things are done are like, it's just like a show. That's the pattern that most brands still live in. You have to do events, you have to do content, et cetera, et cetera. And it is very nice how the economists define this, the economic function happening here. They call, if you see at the right, at the second, the, the, on the right column, the word, the verb is to a stage. That's why branding until nowadays has been pretty much about making a show, a, a show. The more you go into experiences, the more you can differentiate your products and services. Look, when, when we were in a paradigm of commodities, there was very little differentiation and very little margin. So very little money to win. The more you go into the right, the more differentiation. So the more marketing, so the more design and the more money you can make. I'm going to skip this case because what I want to show you is the new paradigm because nowadays everything's changing due to uh, te uh, technology, uh, everything's changing so, so fastly. And maybe this is more natural to you guys because you are younger and I celebrate it for you. But just by growing our clients, are in a, are embarked in a constant journey of brave decisions and transformation. On the left, you have a masterpiece that was by done by Catalan, an Italian artist. This banana was sold for a quarter million dollars. 
just hanging there in an art in a contemporary art fair. On on the right, you have Porsche's new prototypes of flying cars. The luxury brands are doing small cars. That was unthinkable some years ago. And even the most admired CEOs of the world smoke marijuana on YouTube or the, the serious English. I mean, you can combine tattoos and tuxedos. Uh, at Mattel, they have a very hard time uh, designing, designing toys that, that, are, that are not necessarily of one unique race or one unique uh, sexual orientation. So everything's mixed and everything's fun, but it is more difficult for brands because traditional segmentation doesn't work. You have here luxury brands pulling meaning from street culture, or you have super luxury brands like Gucci pretending or trying to be or being directly like social activists. What is happening here? What is the new paradigm here? Well, the thing is that identity, our business today is no longer not just about products or experiences, but about beliefs. And that's the ultimate message I want to convey today because brands just like people are about embracing and sharing beliefs, not about limiting them. Traditional segmentation was about saying, this brand is for these people. Nowadays, strong brands say, this brand is for the people who stands for these principles. And with these principles, we can do everything. That's how Apple has become uh, an everything company, a versatile meta brand when it was only a, 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 a company making computers. Now computers represent less than 10% of the income of Apple. And same thing with Adobe. Adobe was Photoshop. Well, Adobe is far more than that now. Adobe is a house power, a powerhouse of creativity that has different suites of products. That's, that happens because they've been able to build a brand all creatives and professional creatives relate to in general. So the new paradigm is the paradigm of meaning. The brands you have to build are not just going to deliver excellent experiences, excellent services, excellent products. They have to deliver excellent values. The fight today is a fight of meaning. The economic function is not so much, no longer just to build the show. Retail is, is not everything anymore, or UX, amazing websites, is not everything anymore. You have to stand for things. And if you stand for the same things like your peoples, you're going to have an audience. So the key attribute is no longer personalization alone or customization, but philosophical, okay? The brands are activists, just like individuals. And if we meet there, we're going to sell stuff. So the new layer is from our point of view, and that's the way we build brands, the layer of meaning. That's our job, to find the value, whatever your client is coming from. Maybe he has a problem of marketing, of sales, of distribution, or meaning. What is the problem? What has value in his story? What is the real value of, it, of his vision? And then express it as accordingly. Take a look at this super busy, easy, 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 simple diagram from Martin Uemeyer, a master of branding, because this explains pretty much simple and clear what brand strategy is. It's about aligning these, these, these boards. So you have vision. Okay, what is real vision? Let's give value to that. Do we make actions, the actions of that company according to that vision? That's the expression of that company, the visuals, the design, the marketing, the tone of voice, the experiences align with this vision. If all those are aligned and the vision is good and the performance in the, in the actions and expression is good, you will have a successful brand for sure. And I believe this, pretty, this is pretty much this. If you want, I can show you one last case, one last video that is cool. Uh, if not, we can just leave it here as you wish guys. I think we could uh, see this. Okay, then just, all right, let's go. Mm. Look, I'll show you another one. To finish, I'll show you something recent, very cool, that not, maybe not everyone has seen. Because this, this idea of values, what's great news for us is that it, this is no longer just in the, in the design studios or in the creative houses. It is also in the business houses. This guy, this guy is Larry Fink. 
He's the CEO of BlackRock. And BlackRock is a company that most mortals do not know. But BlackRock is the biggest investor in the world. He is, this guy is the boss of the bosses, okay? So every year he sends a letter to, to his CEOs. And last year for the first time ever, and that was a huge symptom in the business community, he mentioned business purpose as an animating force for profit. Oh, he was inviting the companies that sometimes were very skeptical, skeptical about getting involved with the society and building brands that were, let's say, purposeful. So he invited his CEOs, his and her CEOs, to invest in purpose. And this year, in his second letter, the first one after COVID, he's inviting his CEOs to go even deeper and farther in that direction. That means that even the business community is seeing value in committing companies and brands to values and share and stand for that. And that's why I want to show you the last example. This is an example that I'm very proud of because for this project, we made zero euros. We did this project 100% for free. And why did we do this? Well, because we stand for the ideals of this, of this project too. A group of workers of Levi's came to us and they asked us to brand their LGBTQ plus employee resource group. The employee resource group are organizations within big companies that help minorities uh, in those communities. And this, and, this was meant to, and this was meant to do all across Europe. So it is the headquarters of Levi's that comes to us and asks us to brand this group that was going to be influential uh, in the company. We took a look at, at similar groups in different companies. I mean, all major global companies have groups like that supporting the gay community. And we did a workshop with them, of course, and we got to the meaning and we did our brand manifesto. And we knew that we were looking for a brand that, that believed in diversity and inclusion and in the right of feeling and being authentic, okay? And we were going to deliver support, positive change, opportunity to be authentic, to be yourself, and meritocracy. Okay. So we were thinking, how can we label that for Levi's? Levi's is actually what well, Levi's is is the one of the biggest labels in the world. I don't know how popular it is in India. It's super popular here in Europe, just like in the in the Americas. So if Levis is, let's say, the best example of what a brand is, what we are talking about is about unlabeling people. We don't want, we don't want anything that says what is your sexual orientation, what are your personal tastes. That's up to you. So when it comes to people, we should all be unlabeled. And we believe it was a super powerful message coming from one of the biggest labels in the world. Like the, this label is asking us to label ourselves. So that was the name. That was the name for the brand and the design stressed to be super clear, but at the same time to be differential. We did this union between the U and the N and, that, and we mixed it with the traditional colors of Levis and, and the, the LGBTQ plus community flag. And that was the brand that resulted. A brand that is versatile, clear, and that has a lot of, uh, that has its own symbol and has a lot of names and games that can play. United, understanding, unconditional, unstoppable, undeniable, unlabeled, Levi Strauss and Co. So this brand is a brand that the community has adopted, but not just the community, actually Levi's is using in their website. And I believe this is a beautiful and powerful message of a, let's say one of the most established labels in the world. And label people make label clothes. In these contradictions, beautiful contradictions, there is a lot of branding power. And by standing for your employees in their difference, in what makes them different, what makes them unique, this brand has had a lot of has gained authenticity, has connected with, with younger audiences and people from, from, from different worlds without necessarily needing to, to buy their stuff, but has been a major success and we are super proud of, and I hope you liked it too. 
you see different applications that you can use even in your daily life to, to, to mark spaces. And again, but however, I wanted to finish this with saying, even if the companies, if the investors are investing in values, even if you see more and more purposeful brands, this is great news. We will have an impact. You young people as designers, I believe you can have a great impact in the world. We together can transform it. We can make it better, but don't believe everything, okay? Don't believe all the hype. Some brands are doing what we call greenwash, okay? Fake news is all over the place. It's not just about politics. It's about design too, and we don't wanna do that, okay? Brands should never lie. Design should never lie. You as designers and communicators, you should never lie. And finally, I just want to say one last, one last, one last message that I tell myself all day. I know I've been giving you some type of kind of a lesson, but please bear this in mind every day. Force yourselves to contradict yourselves to avoid conforming with your own taste. This is Marcel Duchamp principle. And I would love if you, well, and I use it every day because the worst zone where you can be working is your comfort zone. That's why guys, thanks for having me. And thanks for, for this exchange. I'm happy to answer a couple of, ans of questions, but if I can say just everything in one word, that would be courage. Wow, Joan, this was really amazing and inspiring session. Um, you just skipped a slide on the perceptual map um, slide number, I think 122 or 121. Could you, could you, could you share that with us? And sure, could you sure, explain sure. us the process? Back. Yes. You said 120 something, no? No, uh, no, sorry. I, I think it's right at the bottom. Uh, the could process, you scroll down? Design process. No, uh, it, it's, it's the device case study. Oh, okay. 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 Sorry. Um, can find it here. It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you could just show slide number 134. Um, With pleasure. Yeah. Here it is. Could you, could you explain this uh, perceptual map to us? With pleasure. Look, and I'll show you even more than this. This is the perceptual map, right? Yes. We use sure. this, this thing a lot. Huh? And I believe actually, yeah, thanks for asking this because oh. this tool is super simple and super practical for designer huh? and to present designs, you know? You can use it, as Rahit was saying, for, for perceptions, but also for, let's say, for values, for principles, for, for, for mapping, mapping different, different brands, either propositions or explanations that you bring to your client or benchmarks, okay? And it's very, very pragmatical. Look, on here what we have is different examples of, uh, of brands, similar brands from different companies out in the world. For example, and we have uh, framed them. On the left, you have those who are more corporate. It means that they have the corporate name with them, like for instance, Google or Glamazon, or Pride at SAP, SAP is the name of the company, or just Intel. Intel, they just add the, the LGBTQ flag to, to their branding. That means they are very corporate. On the other side, you have brands that are more versatile. That means that you can do more things with them because they don't have uh, embedded uh, the branding of the parent brand, so the official company. That gives them versatility. And that was the type of brand we wanted to do with a label. We wanted a brand that was more versatile so we could do more things with it. I mean, if you use the, uh, your branding is super close to, to the, to the uh, parent's brand, they will allow you to do less things and you will be more cautious when managing it. Okay, that's what- uh, Joan, I have a question here. Uh, that why is unlabeled not very close to PwC or right at the cusp because uh, Levi's is also a corporate brand. So how do you define a corporate brand here? No, because actually we were putting it there at the full thing, but you should see it like this, look. Sorry. But we can also use it like that. And what we meant is that 
is that you, we can do a lot of things with that brand too, okay? Because it, you, most of the times it works without the without the LC and LC and co. Sorry, Levi's LC and co. And it gets more versatile. But we were meaning as yeah. And at the same time, on the vertical one, you have diversity and inclusion. Talking about that, or sorry, I cannot see it. Or the concept of more explicit LGBTQ plus. I have another question uh, Please. there. Um, how do you decide these parameters? So here you've taken diversity and inclusion and LGBTQ uh, plus, um, but how did you arrive at corporate uh, and versatility? Because uh, those were the questions. No, it's an excellent word and an excellent question. We didn't reach those. We working with the client, we understood that the conversation, the debate when doing the benchmark, they were explaining that those were two fields that were relevant to them when approaching the identity to have these discussions in higher fields in the organization. So they were, for them, they were, it was important to position their brand and their group, not as an LGBTQ plus lobby, but as a lobby for diversity and inclusion in general. And when you see, for instance, Amazon using the term Glamazon, the term glam is more associated to the gay community than to ideas of diversity and inclusion. Whereas the word unlabel works to unlabel, let's say, sexual orientations, but also to unlabel people in terms of whatever, whatever, like races, but also uh, religions or anything, you know, anything. That's why it is more in the field of diversity and inclusion. But your question is, is, is a question that we address all the time. Is how do you build those, those trees? Well, it depends. Sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes if you're talking benchmark and you're trying to address a commercial uh, question, you, you use the KPIs or the key factors in the market. So they should come from a market research. So it depends. If you are presenting for instance, different routes, like explorations for a new brand, maybe you just are trying to define different narrative territories, you know? But it is a good question. It's not, the, the answer is not the same for, 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 all, for all trees. I mean, sometimes depending on the, on the goal you, you, you reach. And, and in this case, it was more terms in terms of, of meaning in the vertical and in terms of management in the horizontal. And that was built, this tree was built with the responsibles of the project, with the guys running the project, because it was built to be presented to the, well, to the CEO of Europe in terms that he would understand. Super, this is, this is really exciting. Uh, Joan, immediately uh, today evening, we will write to you an email, um, you know, requesting if you could do a case study article for us on this. So we have a bi-monthly digital magazine called as Weave, and our upcoming edition is on um, uh, yeah is 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 on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this I think is a very exciting case study in terms of how do you incorporate DEI um, concept into design. So um, it would be great if 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 you could author about a one-word page article for us on this in terms of how 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 did you go about with that process. I would be super happy to do that. No problem. With pleasure. With pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, say over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, we could take one or two questions if anyone has any questions, and then we'll wrap up. Everybody's sleeping, I believe. <laughs> no, sir. Uh, we'll, we'll end I, the I session. Think... <laughs> I think more than sleeping, everyone is mesmerized and everyone is yes. <laughs> taking in the amount of information that you've given. Um, you are super you, kind, my friend. You are too kind, my friend. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm, I'm being really honest. In fact, you could just start looking at the comments on the chat box and you'll see how uh, people <laughs> you know, really enjoyed the conversation because while you were showing those videos and typography and all, all everything, uh, we had, um, you know, a couple of uh, students messaging in terms of how much, uh, you know, they were liking the uh, entire session. And, and, and you can see all of that 
by the comments that are coming in there. So none of yeah, us was joking. sleeping. Thank you. Lord. Yeah, I was joking. No problem. <laughs> I was joking. No problems. Thanks a lot. I see a couple of comments coming. Then you just <laughs> organize, my friend. Hey, what else? Is there any other question? Uh, I had a question. Great. Uh, hey, uh, hello. So my, my name is Chadanya. I had a, uh, so, so previously you mentioned that uh, the biggest threat that we have as designers is not being different. So uh, my question really was, ki, you know, uh, there are also people that are like doing stuff differently and designing differently and you know, thinking differently. So how do you make sure that you're in that, in that sea of designers and that crowd, um, you're really actually standing out? Huh. Good question. Very good question. I mean, by I, I believe it's a little bit in the last slide I show. No, you keep to to contradict. I mean, you keep to struggle, struggling to contradict yourself. I mean, being super humble about what you believe and about what you create. And uh, I mean, if, if if you keep your same thoughts for a long time, uh, and you don't change, if your style doesn't change, if you, well, that can be a, an inside of. Of needing to do something, you know, but that's an excellent word, uh, an excellent question. I, I don't have a, a true answer for that. I, I what I see, what I see is that when I look back to myself, uh, I think, wow, uh, I would do things better now. If you don't have that feeling as you advance in life or in your profession, like if you look think backwards, like you would do things differently and a little bit better because of that. Maybe, maybe that's a sign that you need to change something. You need to change something. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks to you, Chayam. <laughs> no problem. Uh, sir, I had a question. Thank you. Uh, Go on. Sir, how do you anticipate the future trends that will be upcoming and might be valid for the branding of the other companies that you do? Uh, to help them go, you know, in a long run, maybe five to ten years and not uh, get uh, old. Well, that's another excellent question. Uh, I would recommend. Look, actually, in in full detail, nobody knows. the The future is a, a very unstable place, and we've seen that with COVID. Okay, but but there are places. I mean, do you know what? Uh, well, I don't know. I would recommend. Look, don't don't read design blogs only, okay? Read newspapers, general newspapers. Read trends or ideas more than trends. Look at uh, things happening in the investment world, in the technological world. And if you have doubts, look at the arts. The guys who are anticipating the future now are the techs, are the techies. So it's, Whatever, I mean, what, what, you know, those crazy news about technological companies that it seems that they are prototyping things and that and that. Well, in the end, those things happen. You know, the internet, I know, I remember the first time I used the internet. I remember it perfectly. It was 25 years ago. I was in a library and it felt like, whoa, well, this new thing. You know, those days people was not reading. Well, the technology happens. So if you want to anticipate things, listen to technologists more than let's say design trends and things like that, and go read, read economical stuff, read general press. There is a lot of, of info and insights in politics too, and in the arts. Look, what, what I would, what I, what I think is the worst source of information for a designer or the source combination of information and insights for the designers is to go just to read only design blogs, to use only Instagram and Behance, go only to design events and have only friends who are designers and work in a design studio after studying in a design school and having done a design masters. No, too much design will not connect you with the world. You need sources of information uh, that are different. And if you want to anticipate things, I insist the art and the technology. Those are the fields. Thank you, sir. Thanks to you for the question. So uh, I think we should end the session. 
and uh, we'll move forward to the mentoring segment. So, there are there's family. so many questions, Joan, but um, unfortunately, due to paucity of time, there's also mentoring session and you need to speak with two students one on one. So, so good. Can I ask you the, uh, one favor? We will, no? we will, we will have to uh, end this. Yes, fantastic, please. Fantastic. But I want one favor. Could everyone connect the camera so I can do a screenshot with all your beautiful faces just for once? Absolutely. Let's take a picture together, guys. You've been seeing my, my face all the time. I have not seen you. Thanks, thanks again. Eh? I've had fun. I hope it wasn't it wasn't too boring. Thanks a lot. Uh, good luck with everything. Um, uh, well, I'll go to the other link now, okay? Is that what I have to do? Yes. Sir, I will formally conclude the session and then uh, you can leave. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a great life, guys. If yeah, you want, sir. I am on LinkedIn. Anyone can connect me. Have fun. Thank you. Yeah. So as we near the end of this session, I would like to thank you, sir, for taking thank out the time and sharing these insights with us. Your valuable inputs on designing with meaning have surely helped us. We wish you the best of luck in all your future endeavors. Thank you. Same thing, Saeed. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks a lot.